I spent a large part of my career advising business owners, senior executives, and HR leaders on how to pay their people. At one point, I became an expert in uh, executive compensation. And I was uh, pretty good at making very complex option plans and share plans and co-investment schemes. And as most people are very interested in what they get paid, and specifically senior executives, I could make a very nice career out of that. Until a few years ago, I had a lymph node in my neck that started to swell. And although it didn't hurt, it kept on swelling. And I realized that it was not a good sign. So I visited a doctor, and it became clear quite quickly that I had a Hodgkin disease, a cancer to the lymph system. I remember one of the doctors telling me that um, the doctor stood up and said, I'm sorry, you have a deadly disease, but I have the medicines to cure you. And indeed, um, I had surgery, I had chemotherapy, I had radiotherapy, and nine months after my first doctor visit, I was declared in full remission. I had become intrigued by these magic medicines that had saved my life. And um, I started to investigate where, where, what the origins of these medicines were. And I found out that it was basically a cocktail of four different medicines that were developed somewhere in the 1950s by four different teams across the world. And each one of those medicines would basically um, treat the lymphoma, but you would have to give it in such a high dose that you would kill the patient on the way. Somewhere in the early 2000s, um, Doctors had found the right mix of, of, of medicines to actually be able to treat the patient and the lymphoma at the same time. And I realized that I owed my life to the work of thousands of doctors that had relentlessly worked over 50 years to find the right medicine. In the same period, um, the company I work for announced its new mission statement, which is um, build trust in society and solve important problems. And I was asking myself the question, am I really solving important problems if I'm concerned about executive compensation. <laughs> and I remember a Sunday night I was at a dinner table and I looked at my wife Anne who was there always for me during that difficult time and our daughters and my son and I thought, what am I going to do? What is the important problem I'm going to solve? I took this to the office the next day and I discussed it with my colleague David, David and we gave it some thought, and as pay experts, we thought the important problem to address is the gender pay gap. I would spend um, the years to come, most of my professional life, on indeed helping companies to close the gender pay gap, and I would share, like to share some of my experiences with you today. The first thing we did, basically, is to understand what is actually the gender pay gap, and how can you measure it, what are the root causes of the gender pay gap, how can we solve it? And we you know, asked our friend Google what is out there, who's looked at this already. And we found a lot of thought leaders. And we found specifically um, a foundation here in Switzerland called the Eco Salary Foundation that had developed together with the University of Geneva a methodology to analyze, address the gender pay gap. That methodology consists of two different parts. One is a statistical analysis and one is a more qualitative um, analysis. The statistical analysis, what we basically do is um, we look at all sorts of different elements that determine pay, like your pay grade, like your performance rating, like your um, education level, uh, like your job family, all elements of which a company says those are important objective elements that should determine pay. And then we add gender to the mix. And we basically look, does gender, if all other elements are equal, have an impact, yes or no? We use a sophisticated regression model for that, and the outcome of our analysis is basically the gender pay gap of a company, but also um, a gender pay gap for each individual in that company. So we can basically say, if you would have been a man, how much would you have earned in this company? Now, that's quite scary. <laughs> um, we then move to a more qualitative phase, where we basically look at you know, how does the company design its systems, what do they put on paper, what are the processes that they develop, um, so we go to all sorts of desktop uh, study, but paper is willing. So what we want to know is actually what's really happening in the organization. So we go in the organization, we're going to interview the CEO, ask the CEO, what is your strategic context? What are your strategic objectives? What is your direction? Speak with HR to understand what is the system that they design in the organization to ensure men and women get indeed paid fairly and equally. We speak with the line managers to understand 
how they apply those systems and make sure that in the moments that matter in the employee life, like the recruitment and the promotion, but also the informal moments, how do they make sure that they apply indeed objective decision making? And then we speak with employees. And when we speak with employees, we want to understand how have they experienced, how are they experiencing actually to work in this company, and is it actually a fair, objective, and equal uh, work environment? Over the last five years, um, we performed about 300 of such gender assessments, audits, in 60 countries, and we interviewed about 10,000 people. <laughs> now, when you travel to a certain country, you have certain expectations. Um, at least is what I had when I traveled to South Africa to do such an, uh, such an audit. And I thought, you know, South Africa is a country where they have for decades uh, fought race discrimination, so they must some sort of have this under control. And indeed, when I spoke with the local people, then both the black Africans and the white Afrikaners, they agreed that the color of your skin should absolutely not matter in any kind of employment decision. Now, I also noticed that the position of women wasn't the same as the position of men. And when speaking indeed with people, I realized that both for the Africans and for the Afrikaners, um, the position of women from any ethnic background is not perceived the same as that of men. It's perceived that women are less important, less deserving, and less capable than men. I remember traveling to China, a country that prides itself for the high participation of women in the workforce. And, I, and indeed, there was a high participation of women in the workforce, but also I noticed that there was a very low participation of women in leadership. And in China, there was something else interesting at play. Um, there was also a notion uh, in general that women are, women are less capable of leadership, but also um, women are, like in many other countries, supposed to have the important caregiver role in the families. Now, in China, most of the childcare is subsidied. And what we found is that the childcare subsidies are actually declining quite rapidly. The population is aging quite rapidly. And that is not a really good position for women to be in if you want to make a career. We traveled to Russia. In Russia, we thought maybe the solution is in communism, equality for all. Maybe that is what works. And again, indeed, lots of women were participating in the workforce. But again, very few women were actually um, holding important leadership positions. Here there was something completely different at play. In Russia, like in many other Eastern European countries, um, women benefit from a fantastic maternity leave that can last about three to four years. Now such a maternity leave is a little bit like the medicines I told you about earlier. Yes, you take care of the problem of childcare, but you kill the careers of women in the meantime. Now let's bring it a little bit closer to home. We visited many companies in, in Western Europe, in uh, North America, and when speaking with people in those companies, we, we found that people thought that they had found the holy grail of equality and fairness. It's meritocracy, pay for performance. Now these pay for performance principles, they assume that companies are well equipped to objectively assess performance. So they can actually distinguish high performers from low performers, right? And indeed, if you have a performance management system and you set your objectives in a smart way and you, you, know, you measure that, you measure the progress and you measure a part of the performance. But we also know that in performance management, there's a lot of subjective criteria that, that are coming into play. There is, your there is your appearance, there is your attitude, there is your behavior. And those are all subjective criteria that make it a very important part of your performance ratings or your performance evaluation. In all those, um, uh, uh, let's say, more subjective criteria, the male-oriented type of behavior is much more assimilated with leadership. So also in Western European country, uh, companies and, and, and American companies, women um, struggle to take you know, similar levels of leadership positions as men. Now, what I'm trying to say here is that in all these systems, countries, communities, there are hidden constructs, there are hidden biases that hold women back. Now, I am not here to fix the women. I think women are great just the way they are, like men, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and I think every individual is on their own personal journey of professional development. But I do have a couple of uh, tips to give to the companies. The first one is that gender gaps they start as early as the recruitment process. 
Studies show that if you ask a woman in a recruitment interview how much she currently earns, then the woman tends to tell you how much she currently earns. <laughs> now, the same study also shows that if you ask the same question to a man, then the man also tends to tell you how much he currently earns, but he invents on average 15% on top of it. <laughs> now, again, you know, I'm not here to debate you know, who has the moral higher ground or who's the better negotiator. It's just that the company shouldn't be asking those questions. Then if it comes to performance and, and pay decisions, then that's a whole kind of Pandora box that opens up. But there's things that companies can do. First of all, in setting performance ratings, make sure you never rely on just one or a few people only. But make sure you gather information from other managers, other, other peers, other subordinates, maybe even from clients and from uh, suppliers. Get as much information as possible and make a proper calibration. So you actually you know, make sure you don't rely on the opinion of, of, of one person that may be biased. Um, make sure you measure. There's a lot of information to find in the data. A lot, lot of companies, when they, um, when, they, when, they, when they go through their performance management process, they make a nice bell curve with the, the outliers, high performance on one end and the lower performance on the other end. Split it by gender. Split your promotion levels by gender. Split your spend on education by gender. And you can see, are you really giving equal opportunities to everyone? Then the last, or the, the final thing that people can do in the performance management process, I would say, is train your managers. Train your man managers on their unconscious bias. People don't know what they don't know, but we all have blind spots. And make sure that people understand that I can recognize their blind spots when they're in the moment and how to deal with that. Now the third point, and that's a little bit the elephant in the room, maternity leave and childcare. These are things that still hold a lot of women back in their careers. I propose a drastically different view on women that return from maternity leave and to avoid um, looking at them as less motivated or less skilled. Parenting brings very valuable lessons to life, uh, lessons of life that you can actually apply also in the workforce. First of all, simply the carrying and delivering a baby requires a strength of force that not only learns women that they are capable of much more than they thought, sets a different mental barrier. It gives a level of responsibility, this little human being that is helpless for a man and a woman, by the way, a responsibility that no man, not many people experience when they are in corporate life. Then there's a the sleep deprivation for weeks, sometimes for months, which, te which teaches us resilience for stress, resilience for fatigue. <laughs> and of course, there is the logistical challenges of dealing with children. Whether it's in the morning that you want to go to your work, but the child has completely different opinions, or whether it's in the afternoon and 6 p.m. childcare closes and 6 p.m. is 6 p.m. is 6 p.m. And there is a very, 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 very hard deadline. We should uh, start to appreciate that these newly acquired skills can be very valuable in the workplace as well. Maternity leave is like an upskilling boot camp where capabilities like resilience, stress management, uh, responsibility, agility, and all those kind of things are taken to a whole new different level. And those capabilities are so important in the workforce of the future. Instead of taking women that come from, back from maternity leave as less capable and less motivated, we should start to acknowledge that they just went through a business e equivalent of um, a black belt in martial arts. <laughs> <laughs> And I would say, why not consider promoting women that come back from maternity leave instead of sidelining them? Yes. <laughs> now, what that started for me as what that started for me as a after six o'clock project, it turned into um, a full-time job for me. My 15 colleagues in the team that are fully dedicated to this today, and the 150 experts we trained and motivated across the world. If the gender pay gap would be a disease, then we have actually the medicine. And it took doctors 50 years to find a medicine to cure lymphoma. We will really need that long to close the gender pay gap. Thank you.